Praise the Lord. I think that you've seated long enough. Stand up and stretch. Can you do that for me? Stand up and stretch. You feel good, man. The, oh, get that limp just going. Yes, that's it. This is a, a highly unusual meeting. You know, this is one of the most unusual meetings because this one's starting early and not late. Look at your schedule. We're starting early. So you can stand now if you wish. Um, there's a story in the Bible about the Apostle Paul when he was at Troas one time. And perhaps Luke, in his way of describing it, said Paul was preaching long into the night. And you remember the little young man, Eudix, that fell out the window, and the, the story was about that one. Well, I hope I'm not preaching long into the day, but if I am, you bear with me. We're talking about the seven angels' message and coming out of Babylon, that Babylon has fallen. And I said yesterday as we closed that we would look at the first call to come out of Babylon. And the first call to come out of Babylon is actually in the book of Genesis, not in the book of Revelation. So I would invite you to open your Bibles and follow along with us in Revelation chapter 12, and we'll begin verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto the land that I wish thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will bless thee, and curse him that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram parted. And the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed from Haran. Show what's going on here. Give us just a second. I'm in pretty snug over here. Here we go. Well, you have your Bibles. If we don't get it on screen, you can read your Bible. It's just to make up some technical issues here. It was online. I'm good here. Good. If it's just making mine go to a split screen, wouldn't do that if I wasn't connected. When I was growing up, if I wanted to travel from one part of the state or one part of the country to the other, we got what we call a road. Now, some of our young people here are so young, they probably don't know what a road map is. You know, because we use these phones now that have the, the GPS systems, the global positioning satellite tracking uh, method of going from one place to another. But when Abraham left Haran, didn't have a GPS, there was no smartphone to guide him. He didn't even have a map, if you please. He had no reports of good land ahead, but by faith, and that was faith based in the word of God. This morning, I heard Brother Jordan talking about the doctrine of the Trinity and how some of the Adventist people said, well, you know, it's only by faith we believe in the Trinity because there's no explicit statement in the Bible about it, and there's hardly even a hint about it. Friends, faith is based in the Word of God. When these men say, by faith we put in the Trinity, they're just saying by, by the belief in other men and what they teach, what they say must be. Abram had the Word of God. He didn't have written the Word of God. God had spoken to him. And the written Word of God, friends, is equipped to the spoken Word of God. Many times we, we are tempted to think, you know, if I was among the children of Israel, if I had been out Sinai, if I had heard the thunderings, if I had seen the lightnings, if I had heard the voice of God speaking unto me, thou shalt have no other gods before me, I would have obeyed. But friends, right here, you've got the word of God, and this word is just as authoritative. It is just as powerful as if we heard an audible voice today. And so we can trust the word of God for what it says. 
he left. Abram left Ur the Chaldeans in the land of Shinar. Now, did Abraham say, I think I will wait until the Sunday law comes to get the country? Or I will wait till the church starts to keep Sunday full time before I go to the country? No, friends, he left on the command of God. In this call, as you look at the text, there were three distinct parts. Abraham was first to leave his country, and then he was to leave his kindred, and then he was to leave even his father's house or his immediate uh, family. And while we may not leave our country, we certainly are not to be a part of the political sphere of our country. And friends, it's time for God's people to dissolve all corporations with our governments or quit asking for and accepting favors from the government. Now, maybe the Kenyan government doesn't give the churches any favors. Maybe they don't do things for the churches. But in the United States, the government has become more and more involved in doing favors for the churches. And I want to tell you that every government that gives you a favor is going to somewhere and down the line ask for something back in return. There was a church school in the United States and the government came in one day and they said, we want you to start doing this, a certain thing. And they said, well, we don't want to do that. They said, but you're going to do it. But we don't want to do that. They say, well, who's been supplying the milk for your lunches every day for the last five years? Well, they've been taking government milk for the school lunches. And now they said, we want something back. Friends, we are even going to have to leave our church families, our brothers and sisters, our kindred at times, because they refuse to advance in truth. Finally, Abraham had to leave his father's house or his immediate family. And it was not until Abraham had made a separation that God showed him the promised land. First, Abraham left Ur, and then later his father Terah died, and then Lot and Abraham, because of the strife, uh, the, the herdsmen was so great, they separated with Lot going down toward the plains of Jordan. And after that, we read this in Genesis 13, verses 14 and 15. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Before Abraham was to receive the promise, he had to come all the way out. And friends, neither will we see the promised land until we come all the way out of Babylon. We're not given the option to just come part of the way out. We must come all the way out. In Selected Messages, book three, on page 203, we read this. Those who are truly what? Those who are truly sanctified. Do you believe in sanctification, church? Yes. Amen. Those who are truly sanctified will reverence and obey the word of God as fast as it is open to them, and they will express a strong desire to know what is truth on every point. And that includes, friends, the truth about Babylon and the truth about coming out of Babylon as well. Now, why does, why does God call his people out? Why did he call Abram out of Ur of the Chaldeans? Friends, our God is holy. Is he not? Our God is holy, and if we are to be in his presence forever, we must be holy. The Apostle Paul, writing the book of Hebrews, says that our God is a consuming fire. And salvation, friends, is what we need to be able to stand in the presence of a holy God without being consumed. But we must be holy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. He says, but as he which hath called you is holy, 
So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That word conversation we learned earlier this week, someone was sharing with us. I think it was maybe even Sherry. Yes, I was listening to your talk. It means lifestyle. It means your lifestyle. Not just in what we say, but our whole lifestyle. And it says, because it is written, be ye holy for what? I am holy. God wants us to be holy. You know, the prophet Amos said, can two walk together except they be what? Agreed. And God is holy. And if we're going to walk together with him, we better be what? We better be holy. This is a statement of Ellen Heights that's very simple. Just has six words. Holiness is agreement with God. Amen? Oh, I left out something, didn't it? Holiness is constant agreement with God. It's easy for us to want to be in agreement on certain points, points that we agree on, points that we like, points that fit well into our program. But friends, we need to have a constant agreement with God, and that's what true holiness is. God is holy. He desires those who he made in his image to be holy. You know, if you go to where the pigs are, you're not going to stay clean, are you? You can't stay clean living with the pigs. And friends, we can't stay holy if we're staying around the unholy all the time. God desires for his people to be different, to be separate from the unrighteousness of this world and the sin. When Balaam was called to curse Israel, but then later said, you only say what I give you. And he made this statement about Israel in Numbers 23 and verse 9. He says, for from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell how? alone and shall not shall not be reckoned among the nations and if we were to take this and apply it to our situation today we would say the people of god whatever you want to call yourselves historic seven-day events true seven-day events the real seven-day adventists we're to dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the churches or all those ecumenical evangelicals God wants us to be a holy people. And friends, God does not change. Malachi 3.6, he says, I am Lord, I change not. He still wants a holy, separate people. In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, notice the plain word of God. Be ye. Now let me just stop for a minute. The word ye, Y-E. That's an old English word. What does it mean? What does it mean? Does it mean you? Well, now, I could look at Sherry and I could say, you go get me something, right? But I could look at the congregation and I would say, do you hear me? And when I'm speaking to her, I'm speaking to just one person. But when I look at the congregation, I say, do you hear me? I'm speaking to many people. It's multiple. It's plural, right? So in Old English, when you see in the in the King James Bible, when you see the word you, that means one. That's second person singular. But when you see ye, it's second person plural. So when he says be ye, he's speaking to all of you, friends. It's just like when Jesus said, ye must be born again. He was not speaking only to Nicodemus. He was using the plural form. All of you Jews, you must be born again. All of you people here in Kenya, you must be born again, right? And he also says, but ye, but be ye not unequally yoked together with whom? Unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, and I will dwell in, in them and walk in them and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Amen. God says that we have to be separate from the world, and he makes that very plain in verse 17 and 18. He says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. It's like a call out of Babylon, isn't it? 
It says, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. There's a promise there. There's a promise that he will receive us, a promise that he will be a father unto us, a promise that we, we, we will be his sons and daughters. But those promises, friends, have conditions. They are predicated upon the fact that we must come out from among them. God wants to dwell with a holy, clean people. If they do not come away from Babylon, they will become like Babylon. Because as the text in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 tells us in principle that by beholding, we become changed. And if we keep beholding Babylon, friends, we're going to become like Babylon. Sadly, the prophetic of the church today is one of much wickedness. I want you to know something that Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, starting in verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. He says, know this also, that in the year 2023... Do you think that's sort of equivalent to the year 2023? Are we living in the last days today? Perilous times shall come. Now, what does the word perilous mean? Dangerous times. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud. I'm sure none of us are proud here, are we? Blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Now, let me just say something. Parents, those of you who have children, if you allow your children to be disobedient to you, don't blame the children. You've trained them wrong. You cannot allow your children to disobey you. They must learn disobedience. They must learn obedience to you. If they do not learn to obey you as young children, they will not learn to obey God when they are older. You stand in the place of God to those children when they are very young. And they need to learn explicit obedience. It's important. It's vital, friends. And, you know, I just, one more thing on this, because it, it's such a burden to me at times. When I was much younger, and I was watching other parents train their children, there was this one family in particular, and, and, and they had these children, and they would do something maybe in disobedience or disregard the parent's instruction. And the parent would say, now I'm going to count to three. And if you don't buy three, you know, something's going to happen. One, two, and sometimes the child just sitting there waiting and looking. I determined that I would never tell my children to do anything more than one time. One time. If I told them to do something one time, that was it. Unthankful people, unholy, without natural affection. You know what that means, Brother Sammy? You talked about it yesterday. This LGBTQ stuff. Truth breakers. They don't keep their word. False accusers. Incontent. That means they have no self-control. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. Traitor, traitors. Petty. High-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. It sounds like a perfect picture of our world today, doesn't it? But you know, friends, that's not what God's talking about here. Paul's writing to Timothy because the very next verse, he says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. He says, this, this is what the professed church of God looks like in the last days. And he says, from it you might turn away. You know, as I read those first four verses, it sounds like New York City, maybe Nairobi, San Francisco, London, but no, he's speaking about the professed people of God. They are, and I make this clear, the professed people of God. And as in the councils to the Corinthians, the command is to turn away from them, to not associate with them. Friends, we want to be careful as we consider this, because we can't leave our witness behind. Jesus was accused of being a wine beaver and a friend of the public and the harlots. We have to associate with the world to be the light of the world. We have to be where the world is to be the salt of the world, in a sense. We cannot treat the world 
or the people of the world as if they are a contaminating plague, not to be touched in any way, lest we become defiled. But friends, we must be smart about how we witness. I've had people today tell me who don't want to really consider this message of coming out of Babylon fully. They say, you know, I go into the Adventist church because that's where I witness. I can't help those people if I don't go where they're at. I can witness to them. But you know what? I have never heard that argument. I've never heard that argument about the Catholic church. Oh, we should go attend mass because if we attend mass, we could be there and we could witness to these people. I never heard that argument. You know, we don't go down to the house of the prostitution so we can witness to the prostitutes, do we? We don't need to go into the bars to witness to the alcoholics. There are better ways that are more acceptable. But yet I'm just saying, friends, we cannot accept a holier than thou attitude. We've been told, though, think about this. God is displeased with us when we go to listen to error. This is early writings on pages 124 and 125. God is displeased with us when we go to listen to error without being obliged to go. For unless he sends us to those meetings where error is foretold to the people by the power of the will, he will not keep us. I don't know about you, but there's been very few times I have been in a Seventh-day Adventist church in the last many years that I haven't heard error preached. Now, not everybody needs to go back there. There's been times that I have, and I think someone mentioned earlier in this week, you know, that if you go back to witness, be cautious, be careful. Sometimes God burdens a person to go into a particular meeting to witness, to share, but don't go to worship. You know, the Apostle Paul at times went into the synagogues to share, and God blessed him. But the only time the Apostle Paul went to the temple to worship, he got into trouble. And he was in, in, in defiance of what God wanted him to do. Each one of us, beloved, we are responsible for our set. God is a God of order. He has order. He works through leaders, and that is right. But his story. The leaders of the people have been the ones who have caused them to fail the most. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 16, he says, For the leaders of this people, who? The leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them destroy. In Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 6, lost sheep, their shepherd. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. Friends, the shepherds are the ones who are supposed to be caring for the sheep. They're supposed to be leading them beside still waters and giving them fresh pastures and helping them to lie down to rest properly. But instead, the shepherds have caused them to go astray. While the leaders may be behind the apostasy, the individual person will still have to stand on his or her own and accept responsibility for what they do. God is sounding a warning message in the second angel's message as well as in the fourth angel's message. And if we fail to listen, friends, we cannot blame the pastors or leaders for our downfall in the end because we're all supposed to be students of the word for ourselves. As it says in Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 20, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls. But limited knowledge is not enough. In workers on page 251, as the worker studies the life of Christ and the character of his mission is dwelt upon, each fresh search will reveal something more deeply interesting than has yet been unfolded. The subject, the subject is inexhaustible. The study of the incarnation of Christ, his atoning sacrifice, and mediatorial work will employ the mind of the, what kind of student? What kind of student? Did you hear that? What kind of student? 
diligence. Are you going to? For the diligent student, it will, uh, it will employ the mind of the diligent student as long as time shall last. And looking to heaven with its unnumbered years, he will exclaim, great is the mystery of godliness, 1 Timothy 3.16. We talk about the first angel's message, second angel's message, and we think we think we have some understanding of the third angel's message. But as long as we are content with a what? Limited knowledge, we shall be disqualified to obtain clear views of truth. Clear views of truth. Now, Brother Anthony was here the other night telling us about how important it is to have knowledge, but more importantly, it's, it's just as important that we have to do something with that knowledge, right? We have to have knowledge. And while knowledge of itself will not save us, friends, we're not going to be saved without it. My people perish for lack of knowledge, he says in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. It is through a knowledge of God and his promises that we are to become a partaker of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 3. As one carefully studies the three angels' messages, it becomes apparent that they are really about God and his character. Because fundamentally, friends, that's what the whole Bible is about. Revelation of God and his character to us. And all of these messages are important today. They're relevant today. In fact, I'm not sure what's going on. I think this battery is low. Do we need to put a battery in it? Give me just a second here. Okay, hopefully that'll work better. We've been told that the first and the second messages were given in 1843 and 1844, and we are now under the proclamation of the third. But all three of the messages are still to be proclaimed. It is just as essential now as ever before that they shall be repeated to those who are seeking for what? For truth, by pen and voice, we are to sound the proclamation, show their order, and the application of the prophecies that bring us to the third angel's message. There cannot be a third without a first and a second. The proclamation of these messages is the most solemn work ever. I gave you a reference from volume nine of the testimonies uh, earlier, but here's one from Manuscript Release, Volume 7, page 107. The most solemn sacred work ever given the mortals is the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages to our world. This is what we must do, friends. This is what God has given us to do. How do we relate? I want to spend some time now about how do we relate to the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the second angel's message. And when I say the second day, seventh day Adventist church, I'm talking about the corporate structure that has hundreds of churches. Lost it again. There it is. Okay. Today, there's much confusion of how the seventh day Adventist church fits into this picture. I recently received a book, got a book, and it's entitled One God, One Church. And it was written by a a man who's been a Seventh-day Adventist minister for several years. There was a, another book written shortly before it, and they were to be a, 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 a team of books, if you please. But these were by two men, and I know these men personally. And they had accepted the truth about God many years ago. They accepted the truth about God many years ago, but they were ministers in the Adventist church. And at least maybe for a while, they were teaching this truth quietly, not making a big fuss certainly not calling people to come out of the church. But in this book that was written just after, shortly after this man was uh, put out of his ministerial position for believing in the truth about God, he's making an appeal to the believers that, that this non-Trinitarian movement is a danger to the church. Now, wait a minute. Didn't I just tell you he accepted the non-Trinitarian position? But he's saying that this movement, now notice what I'm saying carefully because he was careful in the way he said it for sure. He said the non-Trinitarian movement 
is a danger to the church. I'm sorry, the non-Trinitarian truth. But he says that this movement is taking members away from the church, and that's dangerous because he has this idea that there's one true God, but there's one church, and that church is still the corporate Seventh-day Adventist church, and that church is going through to the end no matter what. It has, in fact, he states it has an unconditional promise that it's going to go through. And then he has this elaborate way of expounding on one of the statements of Ellen White that is absolutely not sound at all. But I want you to take a lesson from the Bible. I want, want us to go to Jeremiah chapter 31. And we're going to read some verses here. And we're going to look at them a little carefully. Verse 35 first. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. The sun, the sun which gives a light by day, the moon and the stars which give a light by night, and the seeds which wave, which the, the waves are the... Verse 36, he says, If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Verse 37, thus saith the Lord, if the heaven above can be measured, can it? And the foundations of the earth searched up beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Wow. This seemed to the Jewish people pretty foolproof. As long as the sun was rising and setting, as long as the moon was going through its phases, as long as the tides were coming in and going out, Israel would be a nation before them forever. And every day that the sun rose and those tides ascended and fell, the proud Jews could boast in their heart that he was the favor of God. In Christ Object Lessons, on page 294, the Jewish people cherished the idea that they were the favorites of heaven and that they were always to be exalted as the church of God. They were the children of Abraham, they declared, and so firm did the foundation of their prosperity seem to them that they defied earth and heaven to dispossess them of their rights. By their lives of unfaithfulness, they were preparing for the condemnation of heaven and for separation from God. She says they defied earth and even heaven to dispossess themselves of their right. When Jesus left the temple for the last time and he said, behold, your house, not my father's house anymore, but your house is left unto you desolate. You can be sure, friends, that the rabbis and the priests got out Jeremiah 31. They opened the scroll and they read it and they said, that man is an imposter because he has broken the scripture. The scripture says as long as the sun is coming up and going down, as long as the moon is going through its phases and the tides are coming in, this nation will be a nation before me forever. Jesus is a liar because he has broken the word of God. But friends, this promise of Jeremiah was to a people in whose heart his law was written. Look in verse 33. It was to a people in whose heart his law was written. And if his law was written in their hearts, they would never cease to become the people of God. But these people were seeking to kill. They were seeking to break the commandment as they were claiming the promise of Jeremiah 31. The Jews also failed to remember the words of another prophecy in Daniel 9.24 that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And while it may have appeared on the surface that the Jews were promised the kingdom no matter what transpired, the truth is that they were accountable to truth. And there is a lesson for all of us in Adventism. We are still accountable for truth. And we can come out here and we can be a part of what we call this one true God movement. And we can say we've left Babylon, but friends, we are still here today, right here in this part of Kenya. 
we are accountable for truth today. We are trolled. Christ would have averted the doom of the Jewish nation if the people had received him, but envy and jealousy made them implacable. They determined that they would not receive Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. They rejected the light of the world, and henceforth their lives were surrounded with what? Darkness as the darkness of midnight. The doom foretold came upon the Jewish nation. Christ Object Lessons 295, and then continuing on that page to, to page 296, it says, their own fierce passions uncontrolled wrought their ruin. In their blind rage, they destroyed one another. Their rebellious, stubborn pride brought upon them the wrath of their Roman conquerors. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple laid in ruins, and its site plowed like a field. The children of Judah perished by the most horrible forms of death. Millions were sold to serve as bondmen in heathen lands. As the as a people, the Jews had failed of fulfilling God's purpose, and the vineyard was taken from them. The privileges they had abused, the work they had slighted, were entrusted to others. And then she says this, and don't miss this. The parable of the vineyard applies not alone to the Jewish nation. It has a lesson for us. The church in this generation has been endowed by God with great privileges and blessings, and he expects corresponding returns. Now, I want to look at some testimonies about the Seventh-day Adventist Church and about Babylon. But before I do that, I want to read to you this statement from Selected Messages, Book 1, page 57. I think I quoted it to you the other day, but here's the reference. She says, regarding the testimonies, nothing is ignored. Nothing is set aside, but time and place must be considered. Time and place must be considered. Remember, I, I gave a statement the other day, for instance, in Great Controversy. She says the majority of God's people are now in Babylon, right? But friends, will that always be true? No, because when probation closes, there won't be a single person in Babylon that is part of God's church. Time and place have to be considered. So to properly understand the testimonies, we have to know when they were written and the conditions under which they were written. And with this in mind, I want to bring up some statements that condemn, listen to me carefully, that condemn calling the Seventh-day Adventist Church Babylon or a part of it. You find this? In Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 42 and 43. Notice what Ellen White writes here. And this was written in, um, public, actually originally published in the Review and Herald of uh, August 29, 1893, I believe. Uh, this part, or I've got it in here somewhere. But she says, to claim that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon is to make the same claim as does Satan, who is an accuser of the brethren who accuses them before God day and night, night and day. By this misusing of the testimonies, souls are placed in perplexity because they cannot understand the relation of the testimonies to such a position as is taken by those in error, for God intended that the testimony should always have a setting in the framework of truth. My brother, if you are teaching that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon, you are what? Oh, man, that's pretty simple, isn't it? God has not given you any such message to bear. Satan will use every mind to which he can attain access, inspiring men to originate false theories or to go off on some wrong tangent, that he may create a false excitement and thus divert souls from the true issue for this time. This was something Ellen White wrote while she was in Australia, or not in Australia, but actually from New Zealand at this time, but when she had went overseas. What was going on at this time? She says, concerning the testimonies, time and place must be considered. At the time of this testimony, there were some brethren in Australia who were declaring that the church was babbling. 
And in fact, they were using some of Ellen White's testimonies to try to base this. But did they have an accurate basis for saying this at this time? Well, according to the prophet, no. And in fact, not many months before this, not many months before this, Ellen White had written this in the Review and Herald of November 22, 1892. She says, let us, I'm sorry, let everyone who claims to believe that the Lord is soon coming, search the scriptures as never before. For Satan is determined to try every device possible to keep souls in darkness and blind the minds to the peril of the times in which we are living. Let every believer take up his Bible with earnest prayer that he may be enlightened by the Holy Spirit as what is truth, that he may know more of God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Search for the truth as for hidden treasures and disappoint the enemy. And now notice the next part, she says, for the time of test is just upon us for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun. On November 22, 1892, it was that the time of test is just before us for the loud cry of the third angel is not in the future. It has already begun. How? In the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer, this is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. She was saying, friends, the latter rain is starting to be poured out and the loud cry has come. And it was in relationship to the revelation of righteousness of Christ. The message of 1888 was starting to go throughout the church. At the very same time, there were some proclaiming the church to be Babylon. The spirit prophecy said that God was pouring out his spirit upon the church and that the loud cry was beginning to sound. And friends, there's no way that a church can be part of Babylon that's giving the loud cry. But friends, that was 121 years ago. Do you think it's going to take 121 years to give the loud cry? No, I don't think so either. So something happened, didn't it? Something happened. That loud cry got cut off. But all of these statements that we have of Ellen White that speak about the church not being Babylon, they originated at this very time when the loud cry was going. And that was the time and the place of what was happening. But something happened and shut the loud cry off. The question that we must deal with is how does God look upon the church today? Not 121 years ago. Is it still the same church or is it a different church? Have things changed? Have we embraced the message deeper, loved it more fervently, or have we tried to cast aside that message and deny it? Fundamental to the issue of this understanding is an understanding what and how God defines the church, what the church is and how he defines it. First, let me just uh, ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. I don't have a slide for it, so we'll have to open it. 1 Timothy 3.15. And someone quoted this, maybe Brother Jordan the other day. Not sure who, but that doesn't matter. 1 Timothy 3.15. Paul says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground The pillar and the ground of what? Truth. Above all, friends, the most important qualification for being God's church is that it's a pillar and ground of truth. And what foundational truth did Jesus say he would found his church on? The truth that he is the son of God. If fundamental truth is lacking. No organization, no movement can truly be the church of the living God. In the Upward Look on page 315, we have an interesting statement. This statement was written by Ellen White when she, on her first uh, journey to Europe, when she first went to Europe. You have to understand, America is very different than Europe in a lot of ways. In what we call old Europe, in those old cities of Europe, in those nations of Europe, even in the 19th century, you had state churches. You had great cathedrals. You know, we have a couple cathedrals in the United States, a couple. 
But throughout Europe, there were cathedrals everywhere. Belle and White had never seen anything in the United States like she saw when she went to Europe. And she's writing to her sister back in America, and she says this. She says, God has a church. It is not the great cathedral. And she was staying near Nîmes, France, where there was a great cathedral at that time. It's not the great cathedral. Neither is it the national establishment, one of those state churches. Neither is it the various denominations. It is the people who love God and keep his commandments. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in. Where Christ is, even among the humble few, this is Christ's church. For the presence of the high and holy one who inhabiteth eternity can alone constitute a church. We have to have the presence out and be holy because he's holy. Friends, if he is holy, do you think he's in the unholy churches? No. No. In Acts of the Apostles, page 11, it says, from the beginning, unfaithful souls have constituted the church of God on earth. Amen? Faithful. Oh, I didn't read it right. It says faithful souls. Is there a difference? That's who constitute the church of God. Friends, will the church who love God and keep his commandments accept the central doctrine of the beast power of the harlot of Revelation 17? Will doctrine and the final atonement for an evangelical mess of no sanctification pottage will the pillar and ground of truth deny the one truth and the life i don't think so friends the true remnant of god will be those who keep the commandments of god and have the testimony of jesus revelation 12 17 they will be a people within whose heart god's law is enshrined the promise of jeremiah those promises were true and are true for God's people wherever the law of God is written in their hearts. It would have been true for Judaism. And it would have been true for Adventists today. But friend, there's been hijacking of the movement. Now, if I go to a town and I see a bar, you know, where they serve alcoholic beverages, right? You know what I'm talking about. And above the, the door, there's a sign. And it says, paradise does that make it paradise no friends it's a terrible place if i see a catholic church and over it, it says the true church of god does that make it the true church of god just because they say they're the true church of god and if i go to a seventh day Adventist church and i see something that says remnant of god over it does that make it true of itself of course not now let's go back to a basic point the churches that fell from favor of God in 1844 did not far as fall as they could, as far as they could at that time, and they did not even have the Sabbath test given to them. In Ezekiel chapter eight, which chapter of Ezekiel? Chapter eight. There are four abominations listed that God saw among the people. This is clearly a vision for the last days. And the last of the four abominations, the leaders of God's people with their backs to the temple and faces to the east, worshiping the sun. And it is a prophecy that those people are going to give up on the sanctuary message, which they pretty well already have done. And they're going to start worshiping the sun toward the east. They're going to be involved in Sunday worship. And these two wicked things are being seen today in the Adventist church. They are having Easter sunrise services, Sunday church meetings. The sanctuary is accounted of no effect anymore. Friends, what will we do about this? Are we going to live better? Are we going to live different? Are we going to, to be the people that God calls us to be? There's so much history I wish I could tell you on this. Uh, we could tie in with this, and I don't even begin to have time to do that today. It would take a whole camp meeting to do that. But if you will look at the fundamental beliefs of the Adventist Church today, and you look at the teaching on the sanctuary, you will find 
that the teaching of the sanctuary and the fundamental beliefs is the exact same teaching that's in the book Questions on Doctrine, which denies the final. You might say, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't see that, Brother Allen. It looked okay to me. And maybe I mentioned it here, or maybe it was Nairobi. But when the church came together in 1980 at Dallas, at the General Conference, to vote on a new statement of belief, they were given a series of fundamentals that had been prepared at Andrews University. And I was talking with a general conference official, and I'm probably not at liberty to mention his name. But he told me that when those statements were prepared, they were prepared in a special way. Now, you know what I mean when I say double speak? If someone does double speak, you know, you say something, but it can be interpreted two ways. But he said they wrote them in triple speak. They tried to write them in such a way that if you were one of the old time historic advents, you'd say, yeah, this sounds just like our message. But if you believed in this, you could read it and it would sound just like that to you. And if you were somewhere in the middle, it sounded good too. But this theology is exactly the same theology of questions on doctrine, that there's no final atonement and there's no sanctification for, good for God's people. Friends, we have denied the only true God and his son. We have lightly regarded the Sabbath. Even in the churches today, neuro-linguistic programming. Have you ever heard of NLP, what they call NLP? Neuro-linguistic programming. The pastors are trained to hypnotize people. How much more must happen before God apologizes? Now listen to me. How much more must happen before God has to apologize to those fallen churches in 1844 who rejected far less light than, than the Adventist church has today, and yet he called them fallen? And yet we say this church is not fallen. It would be like a child who has taken a candy bar. And we have we have punished that child and we have berated that child for stealing a candy bar. But we go steal the whole bank and it's okay with God. He doesn't do anything about it. Beloved, before we can teach others to come out of Babylon, we must come out of Babylon in all of our forms. The teaching that Babylon has fallen and to come out of her has never been and never will be a popular message. If we, by the grace of God, have seen the brilliant light of the first angel's message, we will not hold our peace to any who are in danger of perishing with Babylon. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we certainly want to rightly divide your word of truth, and we want to rightly understand, rightly divide the testimonies as well. And we understand that some of the testimonies written at a specific time, when your people were falling in line and your Holy Spirit was being poured out, they certainly had the truth for that time those people needed. Father, help us to understand the changes. Help us to understand the testimonies that speak and prophesy that. Father, help us to. Must it finish in the church or a church king or as a church, another church And even changing one day or another, but to come all the way up and out and all our thinking and mind and our way, and we can be your people. All the people that we can be with you forever. And I thank you, Father, for Jesus' name in the others. I am the together, I have that hope.